Welcome to Literacy Volunteers of Greater Portland's new tutor training. This presentation will focus on language acquisition. In this lesson, you will learn about the stages of language acquisition, get a brief overview of the English language, and be able to troubleshoot student speaking and writing challenges. We refer to our students as English language learners as opposed to ESL, English as a second language learners. And that has to do with the fact that most of our students come to the program already having learned a second language. So English sometimes is their third or fourth language. And it's not uncommon to have a student who's learning English as a fifth language. But it does raise a question about how we learn another language. All of our students are at some stage of development from rudimentary to proficient mastery of the English language. And we refer to those stages of development as stages of language acquisition. There are five stages in the stages of language acquisition. And the first stage one is called pre-production. We refer to this as the silent period. At this stage, English language learners may have up to 500 words in their receptive vocabulary, and that means they're able to understand auditorially up to 500 words, but they're not speaking yet. It's um, helpful to liken this stage to that of a child um, who is not yet speaking, but understands a lot of what is being spoken to him or her and won't speak yet until they've been able to make a, a leap towards production. Stage two is called early production, and this stage may last up to six months. Students will develop a receptive and active vocabulary. So the active vocabulary or the expressive vocabulary are the, the words that the student is able to um, speak. Um, during this stage, students can usually speak in one or two word phrases. They can use short language chunks that have been memorized, although these chunks may, ne may not be always used correctly. And though, you know, according to the stages of language acquisition, it says that the stage may last up to six months. It doesn't have to last six months. Stage three is called speech emergence, and students in this stage have about 3,000 words in their active and receptive vocabularies. They will start speaking in more complete sentences. They will be able to ask simple questions. Um, English language students will also be able to initiate short conversations with people in the community and with classmates. They will be able to understand stories easily and um, especially with the support of pictures. They will also be able to do some content work and that means they'll be able to work with specific subject matter. Stage four, intermediate fluency, is a tricky stage for many people who are learning to speak another language. English language learners at the intermediate fluency stage have about 6,000 words in their active vocabulary. They are beginning to use more complex sentences when speaking and writing and are willing to express opinions and share their thoughts. They will ask questions to clarify what they're learning in class. Comprehension of English literature, social studies content, culture, we can add to that, is increasing. And at this stage, students will use strategies from their native language to learn content in English. And specifically what that means oftentimes is that the more complex the language uh, or the student's um, usage of the language becomes, the more they'll rely on translating specifically like or directly from their native language. And that can be really problematic because the thing we want to be encouraging people to do between stages three and four is to learn how to think in English. Um, because formulating a sentence in your native language and then translating it directly to English um, oftentimes causes a lot of miscommunication and the message is lost in translation because our syntax is not ordered the same way as many other languages. This is also a tricky 
um, stage for students because they've got a lot of skills um, to work with, a lot of language that they're able to use to, com to communicate. Um, at stage four, people are able to, um, or even stage three, um, people are getting jobs where they're required to use the English language and, and working um, oftentimes um, will replace um, school. And so students stop going to school, their English skills will fossilize, um, meaning that they'll, they'll sort of stay still and degrade, actually. Um, and often what we find is that they, they're, because they're able to get around and work and communicate, they don't often feel the need to continue to grow and challenge themselves um, in the language. And that, of course, is a mistake because by not doing so, they do eventually cut themselves off from other opportunities where stronger English skills are required. What we would like is for all of our students to reach stage five, and that's advanced fluency. Um, according to a lot of the literature, it says that it takes students from four to 10 years to achieve cognitive academic language proficiency in a second or other language. Students at this stage will be near native in their ability to perform and content in learning areas. That just means that they'll be able to write and speak almost like a native English speaker. Most um, you know, students at this stage have been exited from ELL programs or ESL programs and other support programs. At the beginning of this stage, however, they do need continued su support, especially in writing, because um, oftentimes students who have advanced fluency skills are taking advantage of higher education opportunities or specialized learning programs. So certification programs, they may be in school at SMCC or USM. And the way that we demonstrate understanding in many of those courses is through writing. Um, and without strong writing skills, of course, you don't necessarily do very well. You're not able to coast simply on your ability to speak and understand the language. You must be able to write in a way that is comprehensible to the person on the other side of the page. This is a question we get often, how long does it take to learn a new language? And the truth of the matter is, is that it really depends on how much time and effort you put into it. So this little chart is handy, I think, at demonstrating the correlation between um, the number of hours you work on learning a language and um, the stage that you uh, fall into. So if you work um, at or study, English five hours a week, it'll take you about eight years to get to stage four. And we've certainly seen that happen and know of stories of people who've been in the country for long periods of time and speak no English or speak very, very little English. And, and, uh, and oftentimes it has to do with not having an intensive enough English uh, language program. Um, if you are studying 10 hours a week, then it'll take you four years to reach stage four. Um, the courses that, the English classes that we offer at Learning Works run six hours a week. We try to match up our tutors with students in those classes. That gives um, our tutors, any, our students anywhere between an additional two to three hours a week. So you're roughly eight to nine hours a week. And then independent study, of course, should account for uh, several hours per week. Um, the, the goal, of course, is to give them as intensive a learning experience as possible because we know that there's a correlation between the amount of time you have with instruction and practicing speaking and with um, your ability to be proficient in a, a, a reasonable amount of time, um, which will allow you to take advantage of um, employment and other educational opportunities that require you to, to know the language well. So in the last um, row, 
um, you see that if you are studying English roughly 20 hours a week as though it's a part-time job, it'll take you about two years to get to stage four. And we see that often in the program, but we see it from students who are working really hard, taking classes at Learning Works, perhaps taking classes at another uh, organization, working with a tutor, doing um, perhaps an internship or volunteering in the community, and all of those things, um, they add up to uh, a number of experiences that allow the student to speak the language, retain that information, and continue to grow from there. So now that we've spoken about the stages of language acquisition, let's talk a little bit about the components of the English language, which are, of course, the, the nuts and bolts that our students are learning to use. This next section is meant to be a brief review of the English language. You don't have to be a certified English teacher to be a tutor. You don't have to know much about the language to start with, but as you're working with your student in troubleshooting challenges, what you have to um, remember is that the English language is governed by rules and that your student is very likely struggling with a rule. Sometimes it can be cultural, which doesn't necessarily follow a linguistic rule, um, but um, when those in those moments when there is a question about the mechanics of the language, then remember that you're working with a rule. And here's where the internet is your best friend. Google is really handy when it comes to trying to figure out what word is, uh, what belongs to what part of speech. And you can simply type in the word and write part of speech and you will get an answer um, also, it will let you know how that word or that um, mechanical element is meant to be used. So let's start with the basic parts of speech. Um, and we're going back to third grade here. So all of these things will be things that you already know. Um, nouns, person, place, or things. And remember, these can be singular or plural Verbs convey action or state of being. So the verb um, to be is a state of being verb, which is very difficult sometimes to teach. And so it's best to translate that um, instead of having to try to explain it because a lot will get lost in your um, your effort to explain this to someone who's not a native speaker. Um, so just translate that. But other verbs can generally just be also translated um, and are easier to understand because they can also be acted out. Um, and it, the other thing to know about verbs is that they're conjugated. So the verb to be, when we conjugate it, it's I am, you are, he is, she is, it is, they are, you are, we are. So we conjugate them first person, second person, and those can be first person plural, second person plural, third person plural, third person singular. Um, and so if you bump up into a bump into a verb or a challenge that a student's having with the verb or you hear them constantly speaking and there's not any subject verb agreement, then that's when you want to give them a note to, to conjugate. Um, pronouns. These take the name the, the, the uh, place of proper nouns. So I would say I instead of Tionda. You would say I instead of your name or you. Um, if you're talking to your student instead of your student's name, but it, it's an element that helps us, uh, prevents us from being really redundant when we're speaking. Um, adjectives describe. Adverbs add meaning to verbs and other um, adverbs, and so we'll talk about that in, in the examples that follow this slide. Conjunctions connect ideas, so and, but, um, and prepositions show relationships between nouns or pronouns or other words in a sentence. Um, there are prepositions of place, prepositions of time. Um, interjections are words that demonstrate emotion. Here's where we have examples of all of these. So we know 
um, the nouns. I won't belabor that. And we understand verbs. I won't belabor that either. I do want to take a moment to look at adverbs, which are generally our L-Y words. Um, so we talk about uh, a word that um, adds meaning or changes the meaning of a verb. Then these are the words that can do that. Someone can happily um, jump or they can uh, suddenly jump. Um, and as you can see, those adverbs change the, the way that we interpret that verb. Um, prepositions are really tricky for English language learners. And much of that has to do with the fact that m most of the, the most common prepositions all begin with vowels. And vowel sounds are difficult to detect if you are um, new to a certain language sometimes, um, especially short vowel sounds um, in short words. So on, in, at, um, of, those words can sound exactly the same to someone um, who's not very practiced in the language and they will need to be distinguished um, so that they're using them correctly. Uh, it's, a, it's an incredibly common error um, or that students make, and it's something to be patient with. It's something to remind. It's also something not to belabor all of the time because um, talking about it more seems to just cause more confusion in my experience. But choosing one to focus on um, at a time is helpful in distinguishing that that one from all of the other ones and then working on the other ones um, as they come up um, and individually giving them specific time um, and attention so that the student is able to make the distinction between how they're used. Articles are another tricky area for English language learners. Um, and most of it has to do with the fact that the way we use articles in English differs um, greatly from the way that articles are used in other languages, especially Latin-based languages. Um, but let's take a look at these sentences here and just talk about how we use articles in English. We need articles to either speak generally or specifically, and we're always speaking either generally or specifically, which means we always need to use one of these three articles. So on the incorrect side, um, we see in the in the chart here in the middle, she is girl. Well, she is girl is an odd sentence because is is part of the verb to be, to be, and it's a state of being verb. So when we say she is girl, we're saying something different. We're saying, we're not saying what we truly mean. What we want to say is she is a girl and we must use a because there are many, many girls in the world. She is just one. A means one. She is a girl. I have umbrella. Of course, we can't say that. The problem with this sentence, of course, is that umbrella begins with a U. And with words that begin with vowels, the article we use is an. We have to have that in next to that A in order to make the transition from the A at the beginning of the article to the um, beginning of the the word that begins with the vowel. So I have an umbrella, but this is also true for words that have vowel sounds at the beginning of them instead of simply a vowel that starts it. So for the word hour, for example, um, we would never say a hour. We would say an hour. And that is because despite hour beginning with an H, the beginning sound we hear is a vowel sound, so we must have the an article. The question here, um, where is hat? As I said, in English, we're always speaking specifically. Hat, in this case, is not a name, and so we can't say that. It's an article, it's an object, it's a thing, and so we have to have an article to, um, um, to be speaking about it specifically. So where is the hat in this case? Um, and as I said, this is an area that is really tricky for a lot of English language learners, and much of it has to do with the fact that in many Latin-based languages, the article the is used in general. And uh, for instance, a student might say, he's the lawyer. In English, we would never say he is the lawyer unless 
there is something happening and this particular lawyer is the center of the discussion. Um, and we're, we're noting um, his particular occupation um, because that plays a role in whatever it is that we're talking about. But in general, when we're speaking in general, we would say he is a lawyer. But this is something that students who are learning to speak English have to adjust to, and it's a little bit tricky for them sometimes. This issue with the word the brings us to this slide um, so we can talk about when not to use this article. So we don't use it when we're talking about countries unless the name of the country contains a noun. For instance, the United States of America, the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Virgin Islands, the Czech Republic. Um, but we, we don't say the England. It is England. That's the proper noun. Um, we don't use the, when we're talking about meals, we don't say the breakfast or the lunch or the dinner, but in some languages, that is in fact what you would say. But in English, we would say, we had a good time at the dinner if we're speaking specifically about a particular dinner that we went to. Otherwise, we would say, we had dinner. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we don't use the, when we're talking about jobs. So we would say he is a journalist, not the journalist. We don't use the with proper nouns, and we don't use the with English, but in fact, in some other languages, you do use the. Question words are another um, thing that can be really tricky for English language learners, and that's because questions are not constructed the same way in all languages. For instance, in Spanish, the word how is used to ask for names, como se llama, but in English we would say what, what is your name. In Spanish, como se llama means how are you called, but that isn't how we construct that question in English. Um, and this goes back to the idea that students have to learn how to begin to think in English and construct questions in English. Um, and we help them do this by building what we call automaticity. It's a reflex that you have. It's the ability to group certain words that commonly occur in the same pattern together automatically. And we do this through practice. So a lot of the times um, when we do uh, lessons or we're teaching or working with our student on question words, it's really about helping them to practice asking questions. And we go back and forth building that automaticity, uh, automaticity excuse me, um, so that when they leave that session with you, they've built a reflex and automatically they know how to ask these questions and which question words would be most appropriate for a particular question in English. Some other common language elements that um, you should be aware of and you should be aware of how your student is using these are superlatives, comparatives, and phrasal verbs. Um, so here's what you should know about superlatives. We use superlatives when we're comparing more than, or at least three things, I should say. And as you can see from looking at the words that are there listed next to superlatives, we've got the coolest, the most beautiful, the safest, and the most gorgeous. We have two different kinds of superlatives, basically. We have superlatives for short words and superlatives for long words. We add EST to short words. Um, all superlatives must have the word the preceding them. But for longer words, generally more than two syllables, we can't add EST and make them longer. It just becomes really awkward. So we add the most, um, the most beautiful or the most gorgeous. Those are our superlatives. Um, comparatives, you're comparing two things, and these are our EI words, uh, or sorry, ER words. Um, so we've got um, prettier, hotter than, for instance. But um, for when we when we want to be comparing something and saying that it is the best. Um, then that's the superlative. The best is the superlative. Better than is the comparative. 
Phrasal verbs are incredibly difficult to master in English. And, um, and that's because we have so many of them. Also, they're difficult, difficult because they don't necessarily make a lot of sense when you think about it. For instance, the word break in, um, we understand break or our students may understand the word break and they may understand the word in, but together they form a different meaning. And so teaching phrasal word, phrasal verbs is essentially teaching our students the meaning of words, but the meaning that they make, uh, that two words make together. Um, and as you can see, they get a little tricky because we can often use the same verb, for instance, but pair it with um, a different short word and create a totally different meaning. So break in, break up, break down, all of those have a different meaning that the student must understand. And of course, the re rep repetition of a specific verb in multiple phrasal verbs can be confusing for students. There are 12 verb tenses, um, and they're divided into four categories. So that makes it a little bit easier to grasp. Um, some languages have more than 12 verb tenses, if you can believe it. Um, but we have four, I mean 12, and that um, is one of the things that makes English a little easier for some people from particular language backgrounds to learn. Um, so the first one we have are the simple tenses. Um, the simple present, simple past, and simple future. And we'll look at some examples of all of these on the next couple of slides. Um, the second one is the continuous tenses. Those are the ones that use um, a verb with ing at the end of it. So we have present continuous, continuous past, and continuous future. Um, the perfect tenses are really tricky sometimes. Present perfect, past present, or sorry, past perfect and future perfect. And then the last is the perfect continuous. That's the present perfect continuous, past perfect continuous, and the future perfect, for perfect continuous. But let's take a look at those. Here are some examples of simple and continuous. As you can see, the simple present version of the sentence we have is, I go to school. Um, the next one is, I went to school. That's the past. That action is complete. I went to school. It's done. I'm not there anymore. It's finished. Um, I will go to school is future. When we look at continuous verbs, as I said, those are the verbs with ing. Um, present continuous is, I'm going to school. It's something I'm doing right now. So the answer to the question of, what are you doing right now? I am going to school. Um, past continuous, uh, I was going to school. You're talking about an action that happened in the past, but during the course of talking, you may be relating to the person that the action was ongoing in the past. Um, in future continuous, I will be going. Um, you're talking about something that will be happening in the future on a regular basis. Perfect tenses. These are actions that started in the past and continue into the future. Um, so for instance, I have been married two years. You got married in the past, but you're, you, you are still married. So that continues to be the case. So you would use the present perfect. Um, the past perfect, I had been married one year. The action started somewhere further in the past, but continued to a certain date before it ended. And it is ongoing as you're talking about the experience. Um, the future, I will have been married five years um, by March. Perfect continuous, um, and this is where we put together both the ing form of the verb and we've got to have the past participle. So for perfect, so perfect present, excuse me, present perfect continuous, I have been going to the gym all week. Um, past perfect continuous, I had been going to the gym weekly. Future present continuous, I will, ha I will have been going to the gym for six months by June. So 
as you can see, we jump back and forth in time as we're speaking and the way that we use um, the, the verb, the way we conjugate the verb depends on what period of time we're talking about and what it is that we're trying to convey. Now that we have reviewed the stages of language acquisition and some of the mechanics of the ling English language, let's look at some examples of students speaking and writing. Take a look at these oral assessments. Um, these were um, made available on YouTube by East Anglia University um, in the UK, but what they, they do is they give us several different levels of students to um, listen to and assess. So we've got elementary up to master's level um, students. And I want you to pay attention to what these students are doing well and what elements are missing. What are they struggling with? Um, and what do you notice about each speaker? So it could be a lack of confidence or it could be that they've got great confidence. Um, it could be that they're not able to jump back and forth in time effectively. Um, but pay attention to these things. What's missing and what's um, going really well? Um, assignment six, um, I'd like for you to look at some writing. So uh, the instructions for the following writing samples, they're, they're on the next couple of slides. I'd like you to read and examine two of the following three writing samples and in a Word document or as the body of an email to Rachel, address the following questions. What are the writer's strengths and what are the writer's weaknesses? Here's the first writing sample. Take a look at it. Write down, maybe have a piece of paper handy to write down what is, um, what's the strength of this writing and what might be um, an area of weakness. Same thing with this writing sample as well. Here's writing sample number three. Feel free to pause these slides so you can, you can give yourself a, a chance to read through them and take some notes. Here are some tips for when we're teaching um, me the mechanics of the language or evaluating where our student is and at, at whatever point they are in the stages of language acquisition. Um, it's really important to translate words for meaning when possible because concepts governing some words are abstract and may be difficult to explain, for instance, the verb to be. Um, you don't have to over explain if you can simply translate. Give students a chance to make their own corrections before you, the tutor, corrects them. After teaching a new concept, allow the students time to think about ordering those grammar rules and remind them often of the rule before correcting. Because if we jump in and we correct, we take away the opportunity for the student to make a new connection to the word that they're going to retain and be able to use going forward. If we jump in and correct, then the burden for learning is taken away from our student, actually. Um, provide opportunities for structured conversation that give students prolonged periods of time to speak. Um, so if you're doing an activity with a student, think about how much speaking you're going to be able to coax out of the student. Um, give them time to practice, to build the automaticity. And use high interest sub subject matter. Subjects that students are interested in or passionate about will generally prompt students to speak more. And that's what we want. Um, there are times when in classes we've had discussions about 
uh, how marriage customs differ from country to country. Um, and those have been very rousing discussions and wonderful for getting people to talk. Um, not only do are they interested, but they're um, eager to share their experiences. And along the way, as the instructor, there's opportunities to correct so that the student can rephrase their remarks or rephrase their question with the correction. Um, because one of the mottos that we use in our classroom-based program, and I, I'm hoping that our tutors use this as well, is that perfect practice makes perfect. That's the end of this lesson. As I mentioned before, um, this is a survey of language acquisition and of those components of the English language. And as you begin to work with your student, you'll see those things at work. Feel free to refer back to this um, presentation. And if you have questions specifically about these things for your student, using your individual planning time with Rachel is a really good time to bring those questions up and to get some clarification and resources for how you can address them in your sessions. Thank you.